being a coach has shown me how trapped people can be by the thoughts they allow to take deep root in their minds. But because the roots are so deep and so established, they can feel like the only foundation that we can be safe on. This stuff is so often so ingrained that A, we're unaware of it, and B, we don't think we have control over the effects it causes. All right, guys, today we're going to have a rather esoteric conversation, which I challenge you to show up for and hang in there for, because if you get this, it could impact not only your success as a leader, but also your overall happiness. Welcome to the Leadership Coaching Group's podcast. I'm your host, Liz Howard, an entrepreneur, author, and executive leadership coach. This is where I introduce you to the top experts that discuss the burning topics that leaders at all levels need to know about. My goal is to help you become a leader that you are confident others will want to follow. So subscribe to the show, listen in weekly, and watch your confidence as a leader grow. Hey leaders, welcome back to the podcast. So if you've listened to the show for a while, you'll know that I really believe in coaching and it's not just because I am a leadership coach, but also because I've had coaching a lot over the years. And right now I am knee deep in some very intensive, extensive, challenging and rewarding coaching. And what it's been doing for me is really teaching me about how to look at the thought patterns I have and the way that I express those thought patterns through my communication. And it's been absolutely fascinating. So I want to share some of this with you today. And I want you to know that this isn't the easiest topic to grasp if you've never thought of it before. But what I will say is as we go through it, it's probably going to start to kind of resonate with you in some way. There are certain elements of this that are going to be like mini ahas where you're like, yeah, that is maybe something, or I've sort of felt that before. Maybe I should go deeper in my own mind and consider my own experiences. So I hope that this is useful to you. I do think that it is vital for leaders to be introspective for us to question where we can grow and how we can be better. It really is not a sign of weakness or insufficiency to say that there's a gap or there's a weak spot. And I always feel really, really sad when I hear more established leaders kind of allude to that. Because in my mind's eye, that's silly. Of course, there's more to work on. Of course. Of course, there's plenty of things that we can continue to sharpen or improve upon in our lives. And the way that we think and the way that we communicate about what we think is probably one of those more advanced skills. And if you've been hanging into this podcast for this long, I'm guessing you are a deep thinker and you're game for this. So let's do it, my friends. So, first and foremost, we're just going to talk about you. <laughs> and I want you to consider your current life. So look at what it is you do, what you have, what you don't have, your relationships. Really, let's just look at you. Now, how much of it is a reflection of how you've described the world for most of your life? Let me give you an example. And this one's kind of hard for me to talk about. So I know a person who has decades, decades of professional experience. This person has plenty to offer, a lot of passion for their career. They've pursued higher level education. They've had an opportunity to interact with other professionals in their field. And yet they always talk about how they never have enough. And then they justify it by saying, well, but I don't need certain things. And well, I just don't live a lifestyle where it particularly matters if I have this or that. And so after these decades of experience, this higher education, having a very, 
in a lot of ways, successful career, though not monetarily successful. The same person decided to make a pivot and take a job for nearly minimum wage. And the justification around this is, well, I'm not someone who makes money. I'm not someone who needs money. That's something for those people, not me. Now, I guarantee you, based on the experience, the know-how, the education, even the personality of this particular individual, there's no question in my mind that they could easily be making six figures, probably not even working full-time. I mean, it's it's just like a no-brainer. So when I look at this person in particular, you're going to use the words probably self-fulfilling prophecy, right? This person has talked about for a very long time, well, I just, I can't afford that. Those things are too expensive. Those are for the haves. I'm the have nots. You know, there's always been this pigeonholing for a very, very long time of this identity that this person strongly believes they simply have to have. And they say things to reinforce it. They pull things, experiences to really solidify and provide evidence for the fact that what they're saying is true. And I think that this is very true for a lot of us. So we get something in our mind, and then we look around for evidence to support it. And then we convince ourselves that there's some truth to this. So then we say it again, and we find a little bit more evidence. And then it feels truer and truer and truer. And before you know it, you have this belief. And it can be very, very strong. And this is just a very normal cognitive pattern. So it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with anyone, but I just want you to take this idea, look at your current life, look at your situation, look at your relationships and think about how much of what exists right now is what you've been talking about since forever, (laughs) or at least since your adult life, when you felt like you were able to make decisions and kind of guide your own way. Do you see a reflection in how you speak and the things that you believe to be true reflected in your current life? So the next level challenge is that I want you to think about what you think about. And this isn't really a fair challenge because, again, once we get these belief systems so strongly rooted, again, we come up with this idea, we look for evidence it makes our brains believe it's true. And then we do it again and again and again. And we've created this foundation that is almost unshakable where we think that we know exactly what is true. So if I ask you to think about what you think about, (laughs) these elements, these deep-rooted thoughts are not things that you even think about anymore. You just hold them to be self-evident and maybe evident to others as well. Because it's just truth. It's just like the law of gravity. It's just like the fact that you need to breathe air. It's duh. I mean, there's there's really no sophistication behind it. It just is what it is, right? So I think maybe a better challenge than the one I gave you is to consider talking to someone that you really trust and someone who can reflect to you what you talk about kind of passively, just as the little comments that you make for things that are givens in the world. So it's a given that, of course, the beautiful person is going to get the favorable seat at the restaurant. And it's a given that, you know, that person at work is going to get the promotion because whatever, right? Fill in the blank. We all have our own stories behind that. So what are the things that you think about or that you talk about passively that could kind of point to those things that are embedded deeply in your mind that are creating your thoughts that are leading you to where you are right now. So what you consider truth really could just be a deeply rooted thought. And here's a really crazy thing. And this has been the interesting part of being coached for me is when you identify these thoughts, sometimes you don't even agree with them. So you have these thoughts You've created evidence for them. You've lived your life by these so-called truths. And then when they're uncovered and you look at them directly, sometimes for some of us, it's like, wait, 
hold on, that's not okay. I don't believe in that. Where did that come from? I'm not okay with that. And here are the people that tend to feel like that. It's the people that feel like when they're growing up that they're kind of a fish out of water, that all the things that are around them just don't fit. Wherever they are, they haven't felt like they're home. They haven't felt like they're with their people. They don't feel like they're in their stride. And it's very, very frustrating. And they're therefore very frustrated. And so here's the thing that makes it really hard for those people. And I I think that they carry this with them much longer. So they feel frustrated. They probably communicate that to their inner circle. And their inner circle doesn't like these different thoughts because their inner circle has done the same thing. They've had these thoughts. They've found evidence. They've decided they're true. They're still alive right now. So therefore, the truths that they've created that are safety as far as they know and as far as their brains know, and they want to keep this other person in their circle safe. So when this other person goes off talking about, well, maybe I want to think differently or do things differently, that difference could be at this really primal level, something that could be a bit threatening. So what happens to a lot of people that want to break away and kind of change the things that they're pursuing, the things that are different from maybe what their family of origin have done is that family of origin will try to reinforce the old beliefs so that they aren't held to this different standard. So let me give you an example. I know this woman who really decided that, you know, she grew up in a very small town. There weren't a lot of opportunities. She kind of knew that her mother, her grandmother, all these people had had one job, their teachers, and that was just like what she was meant to do. And she was bound for the Ivy Leagues. I mean, there's just, she was a great student. She applied for the Ivy Leagues and actually got accepted into one of them. And everyone in her family started to say these really kind of biting comments. They're like, well, of course, you're too fancy to come with us to this or that. And well, I'm sure you think you're, this, this phrase is always kind of made me shake my head. You think you're too good for us. And, you know, so they kind of pushed her out of the circle because she was the exception. It wasn't that she was proving that something else could be done. It was just, well, you're this one random exception. And automatically they assumed that they were being judged because she was doing something differently. And that created a lot of pain for this person. Um, I think she's since reconciled it in some ways, but that's, that's outside of the topic. The fact of the matter is when the people closest to you are telling you that you're different and what you're doing is dangerous and scary and that you no longer have a sense of belonging in the place where your belonging was created, it makes it even harder to accept those new thoughts and that new way. It creates a little more resistance and a little less evidence that this new way of thinking is okay. So I want you to think about this a little bit. What truth is so deep rooted in your thoughts, these quote unquote truths that you might not agree with? Is there any? And if so, where did it come from? And what can you do about it? And you probably have some interesting ideas. And if you do, please let me know. I'd love to jam with you on this a little bit. You could leave a comment on iTunes or find us on Instagram or Facebook. I would love to know what you think about this. But one of the things that I would offer you as an idea is obviously you're going to have to expand your circle just a little bit and start to talk to some people who have done more, people who have charted new paths, people who have explored new things. And if this is brand new to you, then you may not know those people. You might not have their numbers and you might not be able to call them up and say, hey, I'm feeling vulnerable I'm feeling unsure. What you can do, though, is find a plethora of podcasts, books, audiobooks. There's ways to access the knowledge and the wisdom and the experiences of people, even if you don't know them directly. But you want to start somewhere. You want to start hearing these success stories. You want to start hearing about what is possible from people that have done things that are in alignment with what you want to do. You may not have any interest in starting the next Microsoft. That might not be your thing, but you may be really interested in being a speaker in starting a business in you know, whatever it is you want to do. There are people that have done these things and there are people that are willing to very generously tell you about their experiences, tell you lessons they've learned and tell you that 
hey, it worked. You know, <laughs> it might not have been a perfect linear path. It may not have been easy, but, you know, here I am today and I've done this thing and I'm happy to talk about it, at least on the platforms that I've already created. If I've already put it out there, like the whole point is for other people to consume it. So there's nothing wrong with searching for that. And in fact, it's quite an honor to know that the work that you put out there from your own life story is being consumed by other people. So find it, read it. (laughs) And the more that you do that, it's interesting. You'll find more. So technology has made it even easier. You'll get recommendations for, well, if you read this and perhaps you'll like reading that, or if you listen to this and perhaps you will want to read that. But I think that you'll also start to cue into conversations with other people whenever you're allowed to interact with other people again, (laughs) but even virtually, um, you'll start to hear when people are talking about the things on the level that you're at. You'll start to understand types of jargon. So for example, um, I've been dipping my toe into some different parts of the entrepreneurial world right now. And so if you hear about someone saying that they're going to make like a seven figure exit, maybe you already know that that means someone is planning on selling their business for at least seven figures and they're going to exit this business. If that's not something that you are privy to, if someone is saying they're going to make an exit, you might think that they're on a highway trying to go a different direction, which is proverbially true, but not literally the same thing, right? So again, you just become attuned to certain language, to certain circles that you may want to all of a sudden be a part of. So start wherever you are, wherever you are. You might even have a mentor that isn't doing exactly what it is that you want, but you saw that they got from an A to B that is similar enough to yours that that you want to follow them. Um, Richard has been a mentor of mine forever. And I just liked that, you know, he kind of seemed like a different thinker. And I didn't have a lot of people at the time. Again, I've known him since I was 10. So, <laughs> but I didn't know a lot of people in, in my younger age who were thinking like him as a former Cold War submarine officer and, you know, doing the things that he'd done. And I just wanted to know more about why he thought the way that he thought. I was curious about it and he was willing to share it with me. And so I don't plan on ever being a submarine officer. That wasn't the point. I wanted to learn how to think a little bit differently and how to, you know, pursue different things. So the point is if there's parallels that you can find in some of the people around you, I strongly encourage you, even if you're 40 years old, to seek out those people and ask them to talk to you. Start to have some good conversations. If you can't find them, find the books, find the podcasts, and start to be courageous. And after you have a little bit of a foundation, ask people, you know, the right way if they might sit down and talk to you, if they might formally mentor you. And remember, if you're going to ask really high level people to do this, be professional, be polite. You know, they don't really owe you anything. In fact, it is appropriate to expect to pay for certain mentoring relationships. It is appropriate for you to buy the programs of the people that you really look up to if you know that's something that will serve you because they are putting it out there and you are sort of asking. And different mentors will have different philosophies on this. But I do think that a lot of times there's a lot out there and you know a lot of these people are getting a lot of asks. So you want to be respectful. You want to be approached as you would want to be approached and kind of remember that being professionally present means showing up in a professional manner. So you wouldn't go to a restaurant and say, you know, I really, really admire this sushi platter. Can I have it for free? You wouldn't do that, right? You would go there knowing that you're going to pay for the meal that you want, for the ambiance, for the service, and that's just expected. And so with other people and having relationships with them, especially if they're at a level where they do that as part of their career, then just think about how you are approaching them. Think about how you're treating their knowledge, their wisdom, and how you're going to show up. As far as I'm concerned right now in my coaching relationship, my coach is my teacher right now, 100%. So whatever she says, I'm going to research it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to show up so on for every single one of the calls that we have because she's who I'm looking to right now. And it's been amazingly helpful. And I already see changes happening in my life. I see a new project already bubbling up. It's really, really remarkable. So be the professional that you are. 
don't come just with a handout, come, you know, with your head on and be ready to show up a hundred percent as a professional, as a leader, as someone who's capable and empowered, knowing that they're doing something for self-development and self-improvement. Again, you wouldn't go to the gym and look at the weights and be like, make me ripped, right? You're going to pick those things up. You're going to do the work and then you're going to do it again and again and again and again. And you're probably going to have to do some other things outside of that to get the results that you want. And it's the same thing with personal development. So (laughs) all that to say, the third thing that I want to offer to you to consider is that sometimes part of the issue is that imposter syndrome could be what is plaguing you, but you don't know it. And let me talk a little bit more about why that is. So these deep-seated thoughts that we have that we believe are truths sometimes shelter imposter syndrome. And the way that you might see that showing up is that you're doing something a little bit different. You're trying to take on a new angle and you can't stop justifying why it is that you're doing it. You can't stop having to prove to others why you're doing it. You can't stop having to explain about why it is you're doing this thing. And the second that you start trying every time you turn left and right to qualify it, then I can't help but wonder if you have just a little teeny tiny bit of imposter syndrome that's plaguing you. And if you do, you're not alone. This is a really common thing. I love to work with women in leadership roles. And one of the things that I will not let them do is fill. (laughs) So what I mean by that is whenever there's silence, like long silence, like awkward silence, I don't let them say, well, and what I meant by that was, or if no one has anything to say, it's okay, you can email me. You know, don't try to fill that. Just be in the silence. It's okay. Because you don't have to prove why you're waiting. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to qualify that. If you ask a question and people are being slow to respond, just wait. If you say something and people aren't giving you the feedback that you expect and it's quiet, just wait. It feels very, very awkward to be in silence up until you learn that it's not. (laughs) You know, it could be awkward for everyone else, but I'm very comfortable in silence right now. And it probably came from the fact that I grew up in a sales career. So I was taught how to do this. And I had to be on video during sales training and seeing just how silly I looked when I would speak up and try to fill the space and try to, you know, justify everything that I was saying or just concede immediately. And I was losing deals, which I did when I was trying to talk too quickly And it's not even a power play as far as I'm concerned. It's just allowing for space. And as a coach, that's part of what I do. I hold the space for you to consider what it is you want to talk about, for you to think, for you to practice some of the things that we've gone through. And you may be a little bit slow, but my job is to make that slowness okay. And to give you a place to actually exercise that. And that's what I do as a coach. And you as a leader might also want to consider the power in holding that space, in giving everyone a moment to think about your insights, think about your words, that maybe you don't have to qualify why you're there, what you're saying. Because if you have to qualify it, what? why? Why do you think that? And I want you to consider that. And then go deep. Keep asking yourself why. So why is that? Why is it? Why is it? You know, for each answer you give, go through that five whys exercise that we've talked about so many times. And I think that it's not impossible (laughs) that the root cause is a little bit of imposter syndrome. That if you feel like you are really having to qualify all the things that you say, that you might have this deeply rooted belief that you reinforce and provide evidence for through your words, through your comments, that maybe a certain person who is like you can't do this, shouldn't do this, that you don't have the right experience, that you're missing whatever the special sauce is. And that turns into this ugly, ugly thing known as imposter syndrome a lot of times. So what do you think about this? I just gave you a lot. I think you can handle it. I want you to work through it a little bit. 
maybe listen to this again, write some things down, and really think about your current situation. Think about how much of it is a reflection of how you've described the world for so much of your life. And are you living what you've always described? Do you have certain elements in your life that reflect what you've always described? And are you happy with those things? Are they things that you want to optimize in any way? Are they things that you have optimized that maybe you want to teach other people that they can optimize as well? This is some really strong cognitive work, but the leaders with TLCG are thinkers. So I know you guys have got this. Get in touch with us. Let us know what you think. You can reach out to us at podcast at theleadershipcoachinggroup.com. Find us on Instagram at theleadershipcoachinggroup.com. Also on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash leadershipcoachliz. I hope to hear from you. Until next week, guys. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. If you're getting anything out of this show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one, and honestly, your feedback is single-handedly what keeps this show going. So go to iTunes and let us know you're listening. Thank you so much for being a part of our community.